again I mentioned before you probably won't get a chance to do this but when it's done we're always checking for dilation effacement station position of the fetal head or other presenting part status of the membranes and for anything up there that might be abnormal sometimes this is on a test do we use sterile or non-sterile gloves always remember the vagina isn't sterile isn't supposed to be so we use non-sterile gloves unless membranes are ruptured uh, once the membranes are ruptured it changes everything because then there is a free path up into the uterus where the baby is it's supposed to be sterile above the cervix but once the cervix begins to open and membranes are no longer intact bacteria can crawl up into the uterus and infect the baby and mom this can cause chorioamnionitis and even sepsis if allowed to progress women still die from this and millions of health care dollars are spent on chorioamnionitis and septis every year we use sterile gloves once the membranes have ruptured we minimize vaginal exams because even with sterile gloves we're probably still introducing bacteria up there because the walls of the vagina collapse inward this question is often on the HESI and I will be asking it on your tests as well what is the most important thing to do after membranes are ruptured you'll get the answer right because you know that it is to check fetal heart tones the concern is that if the fetal head is not well down in the pelvis the cord can sweep out of the cervix in the gush of blood or fluid as the membranes break and this is an emergency sometimes in this sort of test question the distractors are check vital signs assess amniotic fluid but remember the amniotic fluid isn't going anywhere you can check it in five minutes if you need to and the mother's vital signs should not change the fetal heart tones must be checked immediately and continue to be checked for several minutes in case the cord is prolapsed since it may well be pressed between the fetus and the pelvis cutting off the oxygen supply to the fetus and in that case the woman bought herself a cesarean that's the only treatment for a prolapsed cord we used to make women NPO when they were admitted for delivery that was because general anesthesia was usually used if an emergency c-section had to be performed now that we use epidurals and spinals women can protect their own airways and as your book notes there is not a good reason to keep them in PO anymore most units at least allow ice chips but the more progressive physicians and midwives are allowing women to take as much oral fluid as they want because this provides hydration for this very physically stressful time I have a friend who ate pizza drank water and diet coke and watched the movie South Pacific all night as she labored no point in making life any more restricted than necessary most test questions you will encounter on this topic go something like this Susie asks for a drink what should the nurse reply the usual answer at this time until the new progressive dietary measures are used everywhere goes like this I will check your orders to see what your physician allows you can probably at least have ice chips what will you see when you go to your clinical facility probably ice chips and a few providers will allow more but you really do have to check your orders to make sure of course if a woman insists despite what you say and eats a Big Mac what will you do nothing just let the physician know when he or she comes around a lot of women vomit during transition eating or not may not make any difference and you'll just deal with it when it happens by the way we don't give enemas anymore as a part of the admission process in L&D it was probably done to prevent stool from getting on the sterile drapes that are put under the mother during delivery it turned out that it was not an intervention in which the benefits outweighed the liabilities it was decidedly unpopular with mothers too ambulation is associated with a reduced rate of cesarean section what a great motivation for patients and nurses to implement a free and no side effects intervention if women stay in bed during labor most will end up when they get tired and labor gets really intense anyway they need to be turning they need to be walking moving is good in labor side lying if they're going to be in bed is best because it allows the best perfusion the second stage of labor is the birth stage 
it goes from full dilation of the cervix to the birth of the baby. Some people call it the pushing stage. But note the important point your book makes. If the woman doesn't begin pushing until she actually has the urge to push, her efforts are more effective. I've seen L&D nurses tell women to begin pushing once 10 centimeters of dilation is reached. But the women haven't experienced the Ferguson reflex, which is this overwhelming urge to push. By this time in the experience, the woman is quite tired. She's been through labor for hours. It makes sense to work with nature by waiting to push until she wants to do it. Sometimes women actually get the urge, however, to push before they're fully dilated, and in that case, they need to wait until full dilation, or they can make the cervix swell. We call that an anterior lip, and it can impede progress for a long time, several hours. If the epidural anesthesia is affecting the woman more than we would like, she may not get the urge to push at all, and then we may have to encourage her to push without this motivation. There's really nothing like that overwhelming urge that can only be resisted with superhuman effort or a bit of simple psychology. If you do not want the woman to push at some point and yet she has the urge, don't tell her, don't push. She can't help it. It is far too overwhelming. Instead, tell her to do something, in this case, to blow. She can't blow and push at the same time. Try it. It doesn't work. At this time of maximal stress and engagement, she cannot not do something, but she will be able to do this active, positive thing. I remember having the overwhelming urge to push, and the nurse is saying, don't push, because the doctor was still getting his gloves on. And I remember looking at them and pushing with all my might. I couldn't help it. If they had told me instead to blow, I could have done that.